fantastic. Fantastic is the word because we have <laughs> Jamie West with us, our, our MPP for Sudbury. And uh, doing a fine job, by the way, uh, Mr. West. Oh, thank you, John. And uh, uh, Hugh Crisell, of course, uh, chair of uh, the CARP Hello, group folks. here, and uh, I'm vice chair of uh, CARP, of course, Canadian Association of Retired Persons. And uh, we have members about 15 to 1700 in Northern Ontario, and of course, thousands across the country. And some of our videos have been uh, sent to other CARP uh, organizations, one in particular with Franz Jelena, which we did just a while back. And we're going to talk about uh, one of the subjects that France uh, and we talked about at that particular time when we did that Zoom recording. And that, of course, is long-term care. You're very interested in long-term care, Jamie, and you have, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, this video will be going out today, so anybody who watches it today might want to tune in to your, to your special town hall meeting tonight. Yeah, that's right, uh, 7 p.m. And that's going to be on your Facebook page, is that correct? It'll be on the Facebook page, so if you just look up Jamie West Sudbury, you'll see a link. Uh, you know, as well on our, you can go to our uh, our website, which is MPP Jamie West. Right. Now, of course, uh, you representing Sudbury and our particular concerns out here. Can you just before we get into some of those concerns, can you can you give us some idea of what's happening to the government? I mean, uh, the COVID crisis is taking place, and and you're not there all the time. Who is there, and how are things working out? Well, it's, it's interesting you bring that up because um, in May we had debate about summer sittings. And so normally the government rises in the summer and you get some flack because people think we're on vacation. But <laughs> you represent your city. You have to actually talk to people in your city. You can't always be at Queen's Park. And so the government said in May that we should resume sitting through the summer because, uh, you know, because of COVID and there's so much work to be done. And we agreed. Uh, what was interesting is the year before the government basically rose for five months during the federal election because they didn't, you know, Ford wasn't very popular and they wanted to sort of keep them out of the headlines. <laughs> um, so we resumed sitting, but instead of our normal, we have a four week schedule, like four weeks in Toronto, one day in our riding when we're sitting, they they opted for a three day schedule, which means that you have less time to, to tackle things. Right. And then last week, uh, even though it was three days, they adjourned the house after two days and then rose until September 14th. And on the last day, they sort of ran through everything they've been doing lately has been these time allocated, which means minimal debate, minimal consultation, minimal opportunity for people like you to deputize and say how the bill will affect them. They ran through these two bills that both have COVID in the name. Uh, the first one was 195. Uh, more or less, what it, the only part it really has to do with COVID is it, it maintains that we're in an emergency state, which gives the government uh, really some superpowers to, to influence stuff. Um, I don't know why they had to have this indefinitely because normally what you do is you have to renew it every 28 days. Right. Uh, you could just call the legislature back in a 24 hour period. No one really in an emergency crisis is going to vote against it. So it's a bit of a smoke screen, but it allows them to indefinitely do this. I mean, this can go on for the next two years if they want the way it's written. And the second one, uh, Bill 197, really had nothing to do with COVID at all. Unless you include, there's an article about payday loans that you know changes the structure mm -hmm. on payday loans. But you know, we spent the previous three weeks meeting with people, meeting with uh, seniors groups, with municipalities, nonprofits, small businesses, all these different things about you know what they need to, to come out of COVID. And these concerns that were brought up, none of these are in this bill. None of them have been discussed. So there's nothing about how we're going to return to school safely. There's nothing about post-secondary schools. Uh, there's nothing about small businesses. There's nothing about helping nonprofit organizations get back on their feet. Uh, there's really nothing COVID related in it. And the idea that, you know, it's the last week, well, we're, we're heading to a long weekend. So let's say the last week of, of July, and we won't resume until uh, September 14th, like literally a month and a half. Um, and then we'll start working on COVID stuff. Just seems ridiculous. Before we get into talking about uh, long-term care and housing and that sort of thing, seniors are very concerned about the environment. And uh, I think there's, there's uh, some real uh, concern about the uh, some of the environmental considerations and uh, taking away some of the I wouldn't call them restraints but uh, the opportunity for concerns that citizens have with respect to development and uh, from what I've been hearing uh, rightly or wrongly that it might just give uh, sort of carte blanche to to certain development that otherwise might have come under some scrutiny is that correct 
Yeah, so that was tied into 197 as well, which has nothing to do with COVID environmental regulations, uh, but that was in this big omnibus bill. Uh, and so the, it, what it's done is made the default for many of these environment assessments to no. So you'd have to request one, you'd have to be aware that it was happening, and then uh, you know, as a concerned citizen, you'd have to say, I'd like an environmental assessment. And so, the, so one of those areas for default is uh, municipalities. The default is that environmental assessment is no now. So there, there's very clearly going to be a challenge to this. There, there's an environmental bill of rights that requires this to be brought to the citizens before uh, it can be pushed through, and that wasn't done. This is something that the Conservative government has already lost in the past. Um, it, it's very, very frustrating, though. It's frustrating on two fronts. One, because the environment, I mean, you'd have to be living under a rock not to recognize the importance of the environment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so... That the one side is, is very, very confusing. The second part of it as well is that, you know, putting it under the banner of COVID, like people are very sensitive to COVID, they think it's very important, but I think people feel betrayed when, you know, you, you take whatever the shiny object is and you wrap your horrible idea around it, you know, <laughs> to say, you know, this, because I can't, I can't see how you'd argue this being important for COVID. Mm -hmm. Even if you were in favor for it or whatever, it has nothing to do with COVID. No. Is the same thing happening with respect to uh, long-term care? Is that I know this is an issue that I, a lot of us have been involved with for, for years and very little attention being paid to it. And now, of course, uh, the Premier seems to be very, very concerned, or at least appears to be concerned. Is there any real action that can be taken there that, that, that you can see? So the, the the government keeps promising, the Conservative government keeps promising that they're going to do a, a long-term care commission. There's been no details about this. We've been, uh, since the beginning, talking about a, a public inquiry. And the reason we're doing that, it's not a partisan idea, it's just that a commission, the government allows to outline where, what's going to happen. So how much public input is going to have, where it's going to go, it, it puts boundaries on it. Where the public inquiry, there's a public inquiries act. And basically what it does is it takes all the parties and puts them on a shelf. So None of us from any party, NDP, Green, you know, Marxist, you know, whoever, uh, conservative, liberal can, can put our fingers on it. And it just looks for the root causes and we're pushing for find and fix so it doesn't end up on a shelf. You know, we're, I mean, the reality is we don't need an inquiry. You know, you can stop at any Tim Hortons. Well, I guess you can't now, with COVID, but, you know, we could stop anywhere and have a conversation with somebody. The first thing you're going to say is that nobody wants to go to long-term care. Mm -hmm. There's no one looking forward to it. Uh, you know, I'm hoping that my my journey to long-term care is a long way off, but I'm not looking forward to it. My mom is closer to it. I don't want her to long-term care. There's a lot of broken uh, flaws in it. And, and the, the basic one is, I think, uh, is a root cause is that the money that's going into long-term care isn't really going to the people who live there. It doesn't, you don't see the value for the money that's coming into it. Uh, and the government's not funding uh, properly. And a lot about staffing and different stuff that we we'd all know the discussion around. So, so long term care as long term care as we know it, maybe long term care as it could be or should be. That's a right. very different situation. Right. Yeah. And and you know I, I think that a, a, a public inquiry would also get out the idea that you know as much as I was saying people don't look forward to going long term care, there are a lot of people who don't need long term care. Uh, I had met, I got to this neighborhood during the election in 2018. I was just canvassing, knocking on doors, and I thought it was a seniors' neighborhood, but it was just this neighborhood that everyone had sort of grown up and their, their kids had moved out. And then as people were looking for a place to live, it fit their life, fit their lifestyle. And and they were there was maybe a dozen of them having a barbecue together. And what they told me was like, I don't need long-term care. What I need is somebody to come and help me get my groceries into the house. Just put them on the counter for me. I'll unload them. I need someone to take my garbage out. I need someone to like change a light bulb for me. And we need to look at that because the cost of, of you know, putting people in long-term care, the idea of these institutionalized, you're basically going to dorm rooms, you know, uh, this, these small little areas with, you know, four or five of your belongings, uh, you know, after a lifetime of creating memories. It's not really what people want. And I agree with you, Hugh, we have to look at different options. Uh, well, it sounds to me like you're describing Coppercliff when you said <laughs> or Coniston or Capriol, which I know is not in your your. your right. But I, Sudbury is an Asian population, as is Sault Ste. Marie, as is North Bay, as it Timmins less so. But we are we're facing a crisis, and and I don't know if you've had a chance to read Daryl 
Bricker's book, Next. And if you haven't, I might recommend it. It's all based on StatsCan um, results. And it, he's not he's not interpreting it necessarily and, and just making some fluffy uh, pronouncements about things. He's using credible data to say, we have a crisis ahead of us. And I wanted to talk about this. So I think that's what we we're going to head into, right? Oh yes, the uh, the uh, the those now that study that uh, he was holding up the paper was done by Lawrence University. We'll be talking to the uh, uh, to, uh, to the architect of it uh, later on uh, next month, I believe. But it was primarily for those of us who were over eighty, and uh, I know Eddie Schack just passed away. He was eighty-three. He was my age. I know that David Suzuki is my age, and apparently there's eight thousand of us here in the city of Sudbury who are over the age of eighty. And, and a considerable number who are 90. Uh, now, and, and some of us are, you know, relatively healthy, aches and pains, of course, but the, old, the older adult population over 65 is going to be about 25% of, of, of our population within a very, very short time. And I, are, 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 are we dealing with this? Because there's many, many, you know, different phases of aging. You know, we have very active seniors and we have very frail seniors and and a whole range in between. So it is it is a it, it is a spectrum that, uh, you know, you just can't really get your, your hands on. And and, no. the, and and there's different needs throughout this entire spectrum. So it's going to be an interesting study. And, and also just to touch on the fact that some seniors are disabled seniors. They have been disabled people for some time, mm -hmm. but the needs increase we need to change how this works for everybody yeah no i i, I it's you know one of the things in the in the survey that really stood out to me and something that i you know but you don't consider was the barrier winter has to seniors so i was thinking in terms of just mobility like cleaning this the sidewalks mm -hmm. uh and i was aware of of the issues with parking meters that the difficulty of you know getting your car downtown in the snow bank and the parking meter but one of the things i hadn't really concern, considered you know it makes sense when you say it was cleaning your car off from snow mm -hmm. you know and and so it, and it references it several different areas of the study and it's one of those things i was thinking about like you know high school students need volunteer hours and i'm sure there's a system where you know, on the weekend, you can have people basically in, uh, in different areas who you call up to clear off uh, uh, snow from, from vehicles or, you know, you have them downtown or whatever. But I, it was one of those things I was thinking about, like, I hadn't really considered. It makes absolute sense. We live in the north. We deal with snow all the time. But the difficulty of, of cleaning off your car and then I'm 6'3", so cleaning off the car is a whole different experience for me than it is with somebody who's like five feet. Five two. Yes. Right? So it's uh, <laughs> uh, so you know that yeah, there was a there was a we when I was on the seniors council of the city of Sudbury, there was a report developed. It was called the Golden Opportunity, and it it had sort of two phases. One is the the part of the fact that we can make more use of seniors in a sort of semi-productive capacity in the community, and the other part of the Golden Opportunity was the as you suggested, Jamie, the opportunity for entrepreneurs to to have services for seniors. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've done sort of studies looking at the cost, uh, and it actually appears that when you're looking at cost for seniors, sometimes it's, it's cheaper for them to stay in their own home if they have that assistance. Yes. Uh, you know, yeah. rather than going into a retirement home, which you know, retirement homes can be very, very expensive, or into a nursing home. So it's, it's that matter of care, and it is a golden opportunity to make use of those of us who do have certain talents and also for those that are willing and able to service the needs of our senior citizens so is that being looked at in any way now um you know actually my colleague mpp uh Teresa armstrong who's our, our critic on seems long-term care would be more versed but i i know it's important that that there's a we know the understanding um part of the crisis that we're having in long-term care is that because there hasn't been, uh, no, I was going to say significant, but it's adequate funding for health care. So over the last decade or so, basically, health care has been funded to uh, what it was every year, but not keep up with inflation. That, that It's not really a cut, but it's a hidden cut to health care. 
And so what's happened as a result is hospitals and healthcare agencies have been putting seniors who really require more uh, health care needs into long-term care. And that's created this crunch uh, that we've had as well. We just haven't been building any affordable housing yeah, or I, accessible I, I, housing. Yeah. And I think that's one thing we have about five minutes left here in our show, but okay. uh, that the housing is another area. Uh, the surveys that we have done with CARP have shown that uh, health care and housing are both equal concerns. And the, the, the housing always, and we've done a number of meetings and uh, we've even designed homes that would be probably sort of interim housing for those who leaving their, 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 their long-term residence before going into retirement homes or nursing homes. But this seems to be an area that, you know, the, the builders were doing McMansions for, for some time. And uh, yeah. this, is, this is not really what we're looking at for seniors. No. Yeah, the, the, the Minister for Housing and Municipal Affairs, he announced this bill last year um, and, and it went through basically to encourage building of housing. But it, the idea was that it was going to help all housing was going to be encouraged to be built. And the idea, the reality really is that you need the government to sort of put their thumb on the scale and say, this is the housing you're going to build. Because if I have land and I have property and I have the ability to put a, a house on it that's worth, you know, $500,000 or a million dollars, or I have the ability to put on a uh, you know, an affordable housing situation, I'm going to go for the biggest bang for the buck. That's mm -hmm. just the reality of the marketplace. And so I'm somebody who's benefited from, from affordable housing or public housing. Actually, I grew up in Sudbury housing. Uh, you know, I lived there until I was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. So I know the benefits of it. I'm not, I'm, and, and beyond that, just the ability to have affordable housing to have, you know, if you were to look to even buy your own home and this is outside of, you know, this could include seniors as well, but I'm talking about young families. You know that gap from rent to to owning a house is huge now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and we really need to and i have to say as well because uh joel harden who um, we roommate together and he's the uh the critic for for seniors as well he always says to me you can't talk about affordable housing talk anytime you talk about housing i say affordable and accessible mm -hmm. and we really should just be building accessible housing as a standard i was an electrician for for uh, about five years um, you know, we put all of our plugs at about knee height. We put, uh, you know, our light switches a little higher. <clears throat> Why aren't they all around waist height when you go to a senior's complex? They're designed that way, right. you know? Mm -hmm. Why don't you just have that as standard for every house? So then when you're out shopping, every house, every apartment has... Is available. Right. Yeah. You know, Jamie, I was going to touch on something else, you know, and John was alluding to it, the, the value of seniors to the local economy many seniors look after other seniors. They do couple up sometimes, uh, an older sister, a younger sister. I saw that this weekend was somebody with dementia. But I, I will tell you that there's also a very strong informal support for children, grandchildren, the daycare situation that we, uh, we talk about really happens often at grandma's house. And um, without that, many young families could not survive. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And my, my youngest, uh, actually my second youngest, Thomas, my my mother-in-law retired when he was born and and more or less was, was uh, you know, his care provider. I was on shift work, so she, she would take care of him two or three days a week, and then I would on my days off. Um, but the idea, and not just the affordability to make ends meet, but the comfort level you have when it's your parent taking care of your child, because especially with your first child, your second child, you're, you're so nervous that you're not doing anything <laughs> properly, that you're making a mistake, you know, and, and staying with grandma and grandpa, you have like, your kids are happy. Well, they, happy. They, they raised you and you <laughs> turned out. I don't know. Yeah. yeah oh, hopefully you turned out all right. But. <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> Um, you know, there are, are so many issues to, to, to hit in, in this report and so many others. And, you know, I, I think, too, there is a piece here, and John would very much probably, if you don't mind, we can get to it. A, there's a sense of nostalgia towards downtowns or, or towards a, a city centre, and that could be even a town centre, like a, a thriving Cape Real, a thriving Zilda, a thriving... Coniston, where there are services. I know that there's a movement afoot right now to ensure that in new developments, there, in a kilometer and a half, there will be a doctor's office, a dentist's office, and things like that. I mean, do you see an idea in an ideal world where, because we do have these cluster of towns, we could have many small downtowns where seniors 
could continue to walk, where families could continue to walk safely. Yeah, so I'm nostalgic for downtown as well. I talked about growing up in, in housing, but when we moved, we moved downtown right on, on Lloyd Street, across the street from where the old YMCA was. Mm -hmm. And right. so a lot of my, you know, teenage years were hanging out downtown and walking downtown. All my Christmas shopping was downtown. Uh, and I, I know that transition that happened as sort of the Rainbow Center back then, the city center, things started closing in it, you know, and and really one of the concerns, I know it's municipal and I'm provincial, but I think the major concern downtown is that it's the difficulty of parking. I know there's parking spots, but it's not knowing where they are. When you talk about people who are seniors or have mobility issues, like my mom, for example, uh, the idea of parking downtown, even though Parkside is an amazing place to go, it's very stressful for her if she has to go for more than a block to get there. Uh, and so we need to look at those opportunities because there is something very special about being able to sort of walk around downtown. Well, it's the healthy aspect of it too, Jamie. If we don't yeah. move, we don't survive. I mean, diabetes will take us out. To, um, we, we need to pump our legs, pump our heart. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. there's so many topics. And Jamie, when we get back with our regular CART meetings, which, uh, which uh, we always have about 100 people come out to our CART meetings, we're going to have to invite you to come out and discuss some of these areas. We could go on for an hour Absolutely, or so. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> we just want to really thank you very much for, for joining us uh, today. And uh, okay. all the best wishes and, uh, and, and thanks for looking out for us down there at Queen's Park. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity, you guys. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, Jamie.